Hello, welcome to the Thursday, June 25th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida again. In today's diary, we have Jan again introducing us uh, to an interesting little Windows bug or behavior, and that's around link files. Now, link files in Windows are, of course, vastly different from symlinks or hard links on Unix in that they are actual files and uh, there are multiple parameters that you can list within the file. One of them is the location of the icon on the display for the particular file. So, okay, what can you do with this? Well, it turns out that the location can also be a URL. So you can point it to a remote file and that file will be downloaded. The only limitation is that the end of the URL has to be .ico, the short for icon, but that's the end of the URL, not the end of the file name that you are downloading. So all you have to do to hit an arbitrary URL is just add question mark, some parameters, .ico, and yes, it will work. It will download the file. And Jan is going over a couple of scenarios how this could potentially be used maliciously. In order to trigger this issue, the user just has to look at a directory listing that contains the malicious link file. So one way how Jan suggests this could be exploited is if the user receives an email with a zip file as an attachment, unzips it, and then just within that zip file, there is the malicious link file that would trigger this particular problem. And then we got a number of vulnerabilities and patches to talk about. First of all, on Monday, Google released an update for Chrome fixing two vulnerabilities. Secondly, QNAP released an update for its network storage devices, in particular, the help desk application that comes with these devices. Apparently, due to a vulnerabilities application, an attacker could get control of the QNAP Kayako service. That's actually sort of the help desk uh, software that's uh, being used here. This update is not all too disruptive in that you just update the help desk app. You don't have to update the complete firmware of the device. If you're not using QNAP, just double check whatever network storage solution you are using. If you missed any patches, I don't always mention them. And probably the most important patch uh, today is the third one here, and that's in Adobe's Magento Commerce software. Magento Commerce 1 and Magento Open Source 1 are affected. One of the vulnerabilities does allow arbitrary code execution. The second one is a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability that does allow sensitive information disclosure. And given Magento's history and all the exploits we have seen against it, there is a good chance that this will be exploited fairly soon. Adobe gives uh, these vulnerabilities a priority rating of two, which means that you should install the update soon. And there is sort of mentioning 30 days as an example. And Microsoft's ATP research team has an interesting and lengthy blog post about some trends they're seeing with attacks against exchange servers. Exchange servers are more and more a target for attackers, in particular, more advanced attackers. Of course, if you own someone's mail server, that's always a good position to be in. And secondly, of course, mail servers and with that exchange server is often somewhat expensive. Post. Now, Microsoft is reporting that they are seeing two main methods how uh, these servers are being attacked. First one is essentially just exploiting an administrator's workstation and stealing credentials. Nothing all too special about this. The second one actually uses a vulnerability in Exchange CVE 2020-0688. So something you definitely do want to patch. It's a vulnerability in the IIS server that's running on your Exchange server. And that is then often used to deploy a web shell. So 
something that should be detectable if all of a sudden there is a new file on your Exchange server. On the other hand, uh, and Microsoft is going over this in its blog post, attackers are crafty in hiding uh, this shell and also in using basically you know, tools already on the system like the, uh, of course, famous Cert Util and uh, PowerShell uh, to then download and write the file to uh, the Exchange server. So if you're still running an Exchange server and haven't uh, moved uh, all your email handling into the cloud, then this is certainly something to read and to pay attention to. They have a number of different sort of behavioral traits that should allow you to figure out what's going on. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.